eyebrow piercing, pre-piercing consultation. Coming up next on Consultations by a Piercer, episode number 19. For those who are new to the channel, first off, welcome to the Body Piercing and Tattooing channel. I hope you enjoy the videos and find them helpful. Uh, but you might not know who I am, because this might be the first one you've seen me talking. Uh, my name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio, located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. We're going to be talking today about the eyebrow piercing, a very traditional piercing and one of the older piercings that we still do. Uh, it goes through little fluctuations of of being popular and not popular, but it seems to be making a bit of a comeback right now. Uh, we're doing a lot more of them than we were doing six months ago. Average healing time is roughly anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks, during which time I'm going to suggest that you clean the uh, discharge off by using a sterile saline spray twice daily. Personally, I like Nelmet's Piercing Aftercare um, because it comes out in a fine mist, so it's a little easier to use. Uh, you can find comparable stuff at most good drug stores. The main things you want to look for is that it's sterile in a pressurized can. And when you turn it over on the back, the only things that are in there are sodium chloride, a.k.a. salt, and purified or distilled water. Nothing else. Now, if you're using the piercing aftercare kind that comes out in that fine mist, just mist the area. Let it stay in contact for about five minutes. If you're using uh, something that comes out and then it's more like a squirt gun, I would suggest applying it to a clean uh, sterile piece of gauze sponge or a clean pap a paper towel and then laying it against the area for about five minutes. What we're doing with this and what I'll get to next is we are loosening up that, that limp discharge, the crusties, the stuff that hardens and collects on the jewelry. We want to remove that just in case the jewelry shifts or moves. We don't want it to agitate the piercing during the healing process. The other thing you can do is at the end of your shower, pull your hair and everything out of the way and let the water flow over the area for about 30 seconds to a minute, and that will also help to remove that. If you have an obsessive amount of discharge or it doesn't seem like it's coming off, you might need to see your piercer and have them do it. I don't advise using Q-tips or fingernails or, uh, I don't know, uh, screws that you found on the floor. I, it, that constant agitation and movement is probably going to cause more harm than good. See your piercer, have them take a look at it because there's a heavy amount of it and it doesn't seem to want to be coming off. There might be something else going on. So now let's get on to the don'ts, the cross-contamination prevention. Common sense things. Wash your hands so you handle it. No oral contact or exchange of bodily fluids on, near, around the piercing. Keep your environment clean, clothing, bedding, towels, anything that may come in contact with it. Do not submerge the piercing in bodies of water you cannot control the quality of, which is pretty much everything but your own clean bathtub. So in other words, no swimming. Also, keep pets away from it. Uh, especially smaller animals like to sleep up by your face and uh, steal your breath while you're sleeping or whatever they do. I, I don't know. What do they do? Avoid contact with unclean objects. Number one, culprit. This isn't as bad as, say, an ear piercing would be or an oral piercing, but try to keep things away from it. Um, headbands are a, a good example. Dirty sunglasses, that sort of stuff. Uh, you need to isolate that piercing, and I'll get more into that later. Last one, avoid contact with wet hair. Uh, some of us have hair long enough, unlike me, I, mine isn't long enough, that comes in contact with it. Uh, there was a day and age when I had the swoof, the uh, skater bangs, and developed this tick where I do this all the time. And even after I cut it all off, I would continue to do this. Anyway, um... Make sure your hair is dry. Wear it up until it is if it does come in contact with the piercing area. Trauma, pressure, and abuse. Three things you don't want to do. I uh, Do not sleep on the piercing. Make sure you're sleeping on the other side or your back. That constant rubbing and agitation and pressure will cause issues with this piercing, including leading to rejection. Avoid anything that's tight-fitting or against the piercing during the healing process. Uh, this could be things like headbands, uh, sunglasses, goggles, uh, helmets, anything that has pressure on that general area or is going to cause movement of the jewelry is not a good idea, especially during the healing process. Do not spin, rotate, move it, uh, play with it, let your friends play with it. Take it to show and tell. Leave it alone. Let it heal you know, the rest of your life to mess around with the piercing. Now let's talk about jewelry. 
Uh, the jewelry that this should be done with is a curved barbell, either threaded or threadless. I don't suggest piercing initially with a ring anymore. There was a time when I kind of believed that they usually healed better, but I don't really find that to be the case anymore. Uh, curved barbells are just a much better option to start out with. If it is threaded, you do need to check the tightness of those ends on a regular basis. They can come unscrewed on their own. Lastly, on jewelry, downsize in four to six weeks if the jewelry is too long or especially if it seems like the jewelry is moving a lot or getting caught on things a lot. Now let's talk a little bit about pain. This piercing is uh, probably known as maybe the least painful of any facial piercings. Uh, the forceps, for to a degree, if they use those, can be a little uncomfortable, a little pinchy. But the actual piercing is split second. The tissue is pretty soft. It goes through very rapidly. It's not one that's known for a lot of pain. Um, I would say these hurt less than nostrils and most oral piercings. May cause the eyes water. Uh, something about anything that's done on the face, well, you generally sometimes, like nostrils and that upper area, will cause you to tear up a little bit. You know, like you've had a, a, a dark, you know, wonderful memory that just made your cockles shine. I don't know. Now let's talk about anatomy on this one. Uh, anatomy, your best option is someone who has kind of a more pronounced brow. When you pinch down the area, you can feel that kind of meaty tissue underneath there. It gives that piercing more support and, and reduces the likelihood of rejection because it can be more anchored and more part of the face and less kind of closer to the surface. Usually when we place these, we place them at the edge of the eye um, to match the brow. Brows aren't straight like this. Brows tend to kind of go like this. So to do it in kind of an a, like more of an angle to the side seems to look better and seems like it fits into the anatomy a little bit better. Now, the next thing is uh, if you are involved in a sport or have a activity that you do as a hobby or... For work, you have to wear something that's constricting your face, especially that area. You have to wear goggles or a mask or a helmet or something that's going to put a lot of pressure on this piercing. This might not be the piercing for you. Good example of this is uh, when I was piercing the eyebrow of many of the, uh, well, I think we did Mick, Paul, Joey, and Sean of Slipknot. And all of them always had problems with their eyebrow piercing, especially when they were on tour. Even after the piercing had gone through the initial healing phase, sometimes they'd flare up and get bumps. So, yeah, if you're in a heavy metal band where you have to wear latex masks over your face for 45 minutes to, I don't know, an hour and a half, maybe not the best piercing for you to get done. Rejection and scarring is another thing you have to consider on this one. This piercing is notorious for rejection. Um, I think partly because of improper jewelry, improper placement, and people just not having the anatomy to support this particular piercing. Uh, any sign of rejection, you should remove the jewelry immediately. Otherwise, you're going to end up with scarring. Um, and usually it'll be in the form of a line scar where hair will no longer grow in it. Uh, if you've seen anybody walking around and they have kind of a slit, uh, and, and sometimes sometimes people do it for fashion. Some people, that's just how their hair grows. But a lot of them, it's because they had an eyebrow piercing and it rejected. So you should always know going into this that depending on how, how much tissue is there to support the piercing, how uh, pronounced the brow is, really dictates whether or not you're prone to rejection. And immediately, as soon as you see any signs of it, take the jewelry out. Now, you should always have a in-person consultation with your piercer before getting it done. They should cover many of the things that we did in this video or I did in this video and talk to you and answer any questions you may have about the piercing. And they should also explore your anatomy and see if you're a good candidate for it. Now, if you're going on vacation and you're going to be leaving uh, your home environment, I advise waiting until you get back. Um, I know a lot of people like, go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, no problem, or uh, they do them on vacation. The problem with going on vacation and having a healing piercing is you can't control the environment that you're in. Um, it tends to be kind of a pain to just constantly be stopping to go take care of your piercing and swimming. Uh, it's just best not to swim, especially in an area if you're going to a different country where you don't know what the standards are of, of the water quality at that point. And the chances, anytime you have a standing body, body of water, I don't care what you put in it, I don't care how clean it is, there's microorganisms in there. And 
in a situation where you're going to another environment entirely, you probably don't have the immunity for that particular uh, pathogen. You haven't built it up basically because you've never been exposed to it. So it creates kind of an even more don't swim on vacation thing than even swimming. It's like swimming at home, eh, swimming on vacation, much higher risk. Now, if you're involved in any sporting activities or organized activities where you are not allowed by dress code to wear jewelry, uh, I would advise waiting until you're done doing that. Uh, there is, I know there's a lot of things in the market that call uh, retainers or, you know, hide it and all that. Chances are you're not going to be able to do it well enough to get past. It's going to involve removing the jewelry for long periods of time, especially during the healing process. That could be a big problem. And it also is going to probably, even after it heals, there's always that possibility of closure. It's just best to wait until you're done doing that activity or involved with that group and then get it pierced. And I always mention this last, sleeping and isolation. The more you sleep, the more you isolate this piercing, the more you don't sleep on it, the more you keep things away from it, the faster it's going to heal, the less likely you to see problems, and the less likely it is to reject or get torn or migrate. So isolate, 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 and continue to do that after it heals. Listen to your body. If it hurts to do something, don't do it. Well, that's all I have to say on this subject today. Um, Till next time, here's hoping only piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see if your body piercing needs in the future. Check out this other video uh, in this consultation thing. It could be an ear. It could be uh, you know an industrial. It could be a lot of fun things.